for everyone out there online and for everyone here, thank you for being with us at TCF. We'll get things started this morning. Um, the first speaker, uh, Manuel Blanco, and uh, just to show a little bit about his background. Uh, just scroll back here. Okay, Manuel is uh, a senior electrical design engineer at ITW, where he develops and directs new strategic product designs. And he received his BS from his physics from St. Paul, BS and MS in Electrical Engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology. And I'll let you take it away. Great, thank you. Uh, welcome everybody to this year's TCF um, program. Uh, the theme for this year is generative artificial intelligence. That seems to be the buzzword of this year, along with uh, energy and renewables last year. I think both topics go hand in hand. So I appreciate you attending uh, this and hopefully um, this presentation will inspire you to, to look from a holistic point of view um, how electrical engineers are very versatile and they can adapt to different market needs. Um, and also, uh, we will, if time permitting, we'll cover a particular case uh, that I pursue as a hobby as well uh, with vacuum tube uh, technology and how we can make the old meet the new by creating more efficient switch mode power supplies that are lightweight and um, more efficient. So with that, we'll uh, we'll get into it. We're going to cover um, my personal background, experience, some of the products I've designed that led to patented technology uh, with the group design group that I belong to at ITW, uh, and also some some historical aspects of how power conversion came about and how the, the field has matured to what it is today and how it keeps dynamically changing. We're gonna cover some theory on switch mode power supply, enough to get you curious about you know, what switch, switchers are and what role they play in the gambit of products that are out there. And we'll cover some topologies and then time permitting, we have a, a buck converter that I designed and I'm also working and I wanted to hopefully share with you this year a boost converter, but unfortunately I didn't get the magnetics yet. So that will be covered in next year's presentation. Uh, and then uh, for those who wanna pursue the topic a little further, I'll give some references of design books that I've used and I continue to reference uh, throughout my career. A Little bit about my background, as previously mentioned, I, uh, I Originally from Cuba, came here in the 1980s. Uh, I feel fortunate that I was almost chosen into this field. Uh, and I say that because, uh, you know, power electronics was not a formulated field in and itself in the early 70s or 80s. That actually came in the early 90s. Um, most people that wanted to work on, on power supplies, uh, they majored in RF and magnetics, communication systems, and then somehow they needed a power supply for like a transmitter or some other apparatus that required a power supply. In fact, power supplies were not the main theme of the product. They were almost like the forgotten necessity. And at the end of the project, whether you were building a transmitter or a television set or any other consumable, um, hey, they realized, hey, we need a power supply to power this. Let's, let's get someone to do it. And there was really no expertise in this. You almost kind of gathered the expertise based on uh, fragmentations of knowledge that the electrical engineer gathered, because as we'll see in a few minutes, um, you know, power electronics borrows from several different fields. So you can't, it, unlike other uh, areas of concentration in electrical engineering, uh, that, for example, if you're designing semiconductor devices, you're heavily in the in the device physics of things, using chemistry and metallurgical materials to to combine them to get faster devices with smaller band gaps and such. Uh, power electronics actually dabbles into that as well. So that's kind of like a new field where they're trying to make um, you know, systems on a chip sort of thing. So we're, we're, we're consistently evolving into different segments of electrical engineering. And we'll cover some of that shortly. Um, on the professional side of things, the, the first job that I had was in uh, avionic instruments. They're still around. Uh, I was designing the switch mode power supplies that went into uh, military and commercial aircraft. Some of their products that I worked uh, are up there on the top left. Uh, those were military grade uh, chassis and the 
predominant use of those power supplies was to illuminate the co cockpit instrumentation systems on, you know, radiation hardened materials that were used to design the rest of, in, in the case of military applications. Uh, much later, I, um, I worked at Anadigits designing RF amplifiers. That was kind of interesting time for me because it was when I went back to get my master's and I was able to leverage my dual degree in physics and apply that as an electrical engineer to design uh, wafers and and really get to the the nuts and bolts on how devices work. And I, I felt very fortunate to learn a lot of applications from a, a process perspective because I was able to design RF mimic amplifiers that were used in cell phone telemetry. And right there, that's one of those uh, wafers that we, we actually grew everything soup to nuts from, from the ingot to actually laying out the circuit in cadence and then simulating the performance and then validating the performance against the actual wafers. And then, you know, there's probably at least 50 or 60 steps between going from the raw ingot to a finalized die. And uh, to show the appreciation of this, some of these circuits were in the, the physical circuit we probably had over a thousand transistors in it was the size of like a hundred microns by a hundred microns. And the bomb pads that you see there are amplified. Those are like the connection bond points for the bond wire. And that those pads alone in themselves were 10 micron by 10 micron. And um, that kind of gives you an appreciation of, on that wafer, we had about 10 to 20,000 devices. And part of my job there, aside from uh, working with the chemical engineers uh, to design the metallurgy of the electrical function that we wanted to acquire, was also um, creating a die sort program which colorated the wafer uh, based on a failed bin out. So I ran parametric tests on the wafer for um, DC coescence and input power, output power. And I would colorate those, those little tiny dyes based on the performance. And then they would do RF testing. And then they would select the most premium part. They would sell it at a higher value. And the intermediate part would be for someone who didn't have need, for example, certain amount of dB loss and transmission and such. And then finally, um, I was working at Dialyte uh, where they needed switch mode power supplies there because they created traffic lights and crosswalk decrement counters uh, while I was there, which we have a patent on. And the, the gist there is they were migrating all their products, all their indicator products, they were migrating them from incandescent light bulbs to LEDs. The problem with that is there was no power supplies at the time to illuminate LED arrays. And uh, you needed like a heavy current source or a high voltage source to drive them. So they would not just sell the LED, but they would sell the, the power unit with the LED. And the, that gave me the opportunity um, to design some power supplies, for example, on airport runways or on bridges uh, to illuminate the structures at night so that airplane pilots wouldn't crash into them. And also um, illumination cross clusters that were used in like chemical and IP, um, uh, how do you say, uh, uh, hazardous location type of deal. And then that brings me to, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I have a hobby of mine. This is a, my home lab where I uh, build uh, tube amps and repair tube amps and also evaluate circuitry. And the reason why I, I enjoy doing that is because whenever I open up or repair old vacuum tube amps, it gives me an appreciation for how the designers, uh, which is a lost art now because a lot of the folks that lived throughout that era, technicians, engineers, are all kind of gone. And um, it kind of go hand, hand in hand with switch mode power supply design because it gives me the opportunity to visit the schematics and also look at the magnetics. They did a lot of clever things back then. Um, yeah, sure. Back then, yes, they did use linears because semiconductor was not uh, up to par. And it was, during, it was during a time where, like I said, switch mode power supplies didn't evolve until like the late 70s, early 80s, and now they're like everywhere. So they didn't really have that at their disposal, even though they used some interesting switch mode techniques. There were certainly no controller ICs that you could just buy off the market and just have a PWM converter inside and uh, feedback control circuitry. So all that stuff evolved, and, and we're going to get through that. But uh, I just wanted to share with you some of some of the areas that you would not think uh, switchers are used. But 
uh, you know, it's kind of an interesting area. So currently, I, uh, I work at Simcoe Ion. They're a division of ITW. They've been around since 1936. And our main focus is on industrial products, both uh, fans and neutralizing bars. Um, and these neutralizing equipment is used in areas where, for example, they're manufacturing moving material and there's uh, artifact of electrostatics that charge the material. So you need a power supply to neutralize the electrostatics, usually to the main reason really is not to damage the material and for operator safety. You don't want an incendiary event to occur. So uh, we're kind of like a necessary evil in their process, but without it, they couldn't process things much faster. So some, some applications, because um, electrostatics is kind of one of these fields that, that uh, you know, I remember when I was taking physics, they only covered like one chapter on electrostatics and it was mostly related to the forces involved, but, um, and then you never really get much thought. But anyways, to show the appreciation how electrostatics come into play, on the far right, we have a paper bag. Now, when the manufacturer buys or creates paper bags, they buy a drum, probably the width of this room and the height, and then they cut it and they run it through a bunch of rollers. And the process at the beginning of that machine in the middle, uh, it goes through a bunch of nip and stretch rollers. And during that process, they'll actually uh, paint a design on there, a logo, and then they'll actually cut and shape the bag. Well, the, every time, and they're doing like a million bags a minute. So you can imagine uh, a parallel capacitor uh, concept, kind of like when you walk on a, on a carpet, there's going to be electrostatic voltages that are going to accumulate almost like a voltaic battery. So to show an appreciation of what the voltages we're talking about here, we're talking about like 50,000 to 200,000 volts. It depends on how fast and how quick the material is moving and where it's stretched and also the metallurgical uh, co uh, composure of the material where it falls on the electro, uh, electro tribo charge series. If, the two rollers, yeah, the two rollers. There's always contact separation. So another area would be like the medical uh, medical application. What you see there is a catheter. And on the left, how catheters are made is that they actually buy a protrusion and they heat it and they take plastic pellets and shoot it in there. And then they pull it out. But the process of pulling it out of the mold causes friction. And that friction causes contaminants from the air to adhere to the catheter, which you don't want. Um, so our electrostatic equipment is strategically placed in certain areas with uh, certain geometric applicators that are used to address issues like catheter, but it, we can expand into, um, you know, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, uh, doing contactless cleaning with electrostatics versus using UV lights or um, desalinated water and stuff like that. And uh, those are just a few applications where, where electrostatic is heavily used, and that's the main focus. So again, just reviewing what electrostatic is, is contact separation from two similar or dissimilar materials that are operating at different speeds that come into nip rolls and the velocity uh, of how this separation occurs. Uh, and we're talking speeds like 2,500 feet per minute, some are 5,000 feet per minute. So it's really fast, so you can create bipolar charges on a similar on a single sheet. You can have one sheet singly polarized as positive on the top or negative on the bottom or conglomerately one monopolar uh, charge. And the power supplies that we designed are used to create a static plume of charges such that it opposes the, the, the conglomerate accurate uh, uh, accumulation of a particular charge. For example, for example, if we're running a material and it predominantly acquires a, a negative, negative charge, we're gonna wanna hit that area of the material with a highly preponderant positive charge so that like charges would attract. And if you have equal amount of ions on both, then you can neutralize the product and then you can touch it and not have any uh, uh, electrical discharge. Um, so one of the things that switch mode power supplies has given us the opportunity is to create a new gambit of products. Uh, the very top are ferro-resonant transformers, which is similar to these uh, laminations that I have here. We could pass these around if you guys want to look at these. But these, these work very well. One of the things that's bad about them is they're limited to 50, 60 hertz. So if you're trying to get a lot of power out of them, um, you're going to have to stack 
a lot of laminations and change the geometry to get the power and then obviously gauge the wire. And you're limited to 60 hertz operation. So uh, one of the benefits of going to switch mode power supplies is you can have the same amount of power that you would get out of a, a ferro resonant transformer out of a, that may weigh five or eight pounds, depending on the power. Um, you can get something quite miniature that's about the size of a quarter and, and probably weighs a tenth of an ounce. And you can get the same articulated power in a much smaller uh, uh, density per volume. So that, that kind of makes things exciting because now we can embed these power supplies in the applicator itself and we don't have to have a separate power unit to energize the bars. But that's sort of like the thematic uh, process of switch mode power supplies and high frequency magnetics. So as I mentioned, we, we carry a bunch of different products that are either just power supplies and applicators or embedded charging systems that are the applicator with the, um, with the charging or neutralizing power supply. And these are, this is like commonly some of the applicators that we use. This would be used, for example, in pharmaceutical where they want to clean like bottles or, or, or at Pepsi Cola or something like that. They want to shoot an air of uh, neutralized uh, ions in the bottle to make sure that there's no particulates in there before they, they put the soda or whatever material that they need to contain. So uh, this is kind of like the internal uh, breakdown of that bar. You can see that we're migrating from a ferro resonant transformer, uh, AKB 50, 60 Hertz weighs about 10 pounds. Now we're, we're you know, a hundredth of a pound with this little device that operates at 24 volts DC and outputs the same articulated power. And uh, you know, that kind of makes the field very exciting, not just in electrostatics, but also uh, for uh, EVs and uh, other areas that can, uh, you know, benefit from, um, uh, you know, very high density, low weight, more power and less heat. That's always been the trifecta effect of switch mode power supplies. Along with this, we have several patents that myself and the team have come up with over the years. And uh, we've been able to commercialize this very successfully. Uh, and this is one of our new, um, our flagship platforms that we have. And we sell this sort of power supply in all sorts of different fields, even the automotive field, um, uh, also, textile field, uh, there's quite a few different fields that we were heavily involved in. All right, so with this, uh, let's keep the, thema the theme of uh, AI and the design of switch mode power supplies. I think AI is, is, is definitely an interesting technology at this point. It's still, it's, it's definitely maturing and coming up to speed, but I don't think it's quite there yet for, for switch mode power supplies. And so you'll, you'll be able to appreciate some of the reasons why and all the different attributes that are there. There are some companies that are focusing on AI, but uh, at the moment, there isn't an all-encompassing software that you can talk to and say, hey, design me a flyback transformer that's quasi-resonant, that has zero voltage switching or zero current switching with an efficiency of such and such. We don't, we're not there yet. There's a lot of companies that are doing like finite element analysis in terms of the heat, the losses of the transformer, the geometry, uh, and things that we weren't able to quite model, uh, and we had to use uh, basically uh, contained equations to, to get an approximate of that. I think that's where we're making a lot of strides in the field, but I think eventually within the next three to five years, we may potentially have like full AI engines that are going to solve this stuff, as I'll show in a little while. Um, there's quite a lot of, uh, uh, of um, design considerations that you need to take into play, and that's just on choosing the converter. The other side of it is, where is this converter going? What, what market is it going to address? What specific application it's going into? And also the um, EMI testing or any other uh, government uh, approvals that need to be done on a product. You can't just build a power supply and sell it. You have to actually test it and make sure that it passes safety EM, EMI, EMC testing. So as mentioned, there's no all-encompassing tool for designer simulation. Uh, if I had to break this down into how the field is progressing towards AI, I would say that there's tools out there that model the magnetics of the transformer exclusively. Tools that come to mind are Frenetic AI, they're in Spain, uh, Trafolo in India. Uh, there's also an open, open source market 
called Open Magnetics. They're they're actually doing some quite interesting things. Not quite AI, but they're doing a lot of Python programming on uh, systematically giving the designer methods of how to select cores more efficiently for the specific product that they're designing. And then Ridley Works is kind of an interesting software company. They're not implementing AI in its full uh, platform, but they do have a frequency response analyzer, uh, which by far compares to nothing that's out there in the field right now. I think the Bode 100 is the only other product, but it actually talks to you. And the design methodology that's used in the software is you give it some inputs, it shoots out the efficiency, and you can make some parametric changes on there, like if you wanted to use um, you know, different switching uh, devices. Uh, or uh, and it also has a magnetic engine where you can um, layer how the wire is wound and look at the proximity losses and the DCR losses in the magnetics, which is something that some of these other software platforms are not doing. And you know, as far as simulation software, there's there, you know, they're very expensive tools. Um, I particularly tend to like using LT Spice. That's been out since 1999. And it's a the, the good thing about it, it's free. It was created in linear technology. They were bought out for analog devices. And I think the gentleman that created that software, um, he now works for Corvo and he just recently released QSpice, which is another free download. Um, and that came from the Corvo company. And the reason why he created that is for you know, more speed, more efficiency. But I think in, in, in simulating switch mode power supplies, it's not so much about the speed, it's more about the accuracy of, of the simulation because it's not just designing a, a power supply with inputs and outputs and low power. You also have to look at the control circuit. You, you gotta make sure that it works across a bunch of loads. You gotta make sure that the the feedback loop is is not perturbed or uh, goes chaotic on you because then you'll have a non-functional power supply and you'll damage whatever apparatus that. So you have to d design a lot of safety mechanisms in there so that you don't overload the power supply. And uh, if I had to choose a, a product, I would just use LT Spice and Ridley Works because they actually have socket connections to LT Spice. They're not in favor of using Q Spice at the moment. But uh, I would suggest you you, you uh, try these tools out for yourself because uh, they're heavily used in industry. And <clears throat> just to give you an idea of what those software platforms look like, Fnatic AI, their main focus, uh, they have a built-in simulator, uh, but their main focus is core geometry. They want to be able to give you a like, core loss based on core specs, but it's not an all-encompassing design tool. So it's always missing that LT Spice aspect of the engine. And then Trifolo, they're like a finite element analysis software that deals with losses outside of the magnetics, how to recoup those losses, how to select better cores and things of that nature. So I would say they're kind of doing the same thing as Frenetic. Open Magnetics takes a different approach. They systematically grab libraries from ferrites and materials that are out there, and they give you, they're, they're not a simulator. I don't think they have a simulator yet. They are developing a simulator for it. But it lets you select the core material, the gap size, the type of uh, magnetic material that you plan on using. And all these things are based on you know, volume length and minimum area effective area. All these three tools kind of concentrate on the efficiency of the magnetics. They're not exactly modeling the functional of the magnetics. And then you have really works, which actually goes a step further. And it's the tool that I think has come closest to a, a real real time design of a magnetic structure where um, not only can you uh, simulate the circuit and then socket it back into LT Spice, but it also has a magnetic designer in it where you can actually select you know, how the magnetic wire is layered, whether you're gonna do a single layer lay, a dual layer lay, or, or a honeycomb layer lay, all these things play, you wouldn't think that they, they play uh, a major role, but they actually, do play a major role in how the efficiency of the magnetics is done. And if it's not done correctly, you'll get a lot of variability in the magnetics. So you might be able to get five or 10 or 30 or 100 transformers and they work the same. And then when you release something into the production field, you know, at the 1000th transformer, you have something go wrong. Maybe they forgot to layer, layer the wires a certain way or didn't add extra layers of tape. There's a lot of magic, in, that's where the magic sauce is in creating that. But one of the things that, that um, 
well, there's two things that all these softwares uh, don't do. And as much as you simulate these things, you have to actually build it because the actual dynamics of building and running the circuit is quite different than simulating it. So they're interesting tools to get, I look at it as interesting tools to get you started and get you in the ballpark figure. But ultimately you have to get a transformer wound built by someone, get it in, qualify it, validate it, make changes. So it's, it's a constant uh, loop between you and the magnetics vendor, or if you, uh, are up to up to the challenge. You can wind your own magnetics, which is where I'm at. I like winding my own magnetics. It gives me the ability to experiment with different layering types, different. Uh, so if you wind something and there's something wrong, then you have to, you know, investigate what you've done to see what part is wrong, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's where the frequency response analyzer of it comes along. All these other tools, open magnetic, frenetic, portfolio, they don't have a frequency response analyzer component to their engine. They just kind of concentrate on the geometry, the finite element of the losses, where the potential pinch points are in the magnetics where you're losing efficiency. But the, the really magnetics really is the only company in my view that I think is making strides to that. And I think, you know, maybe in another five, 10 years, if AI takes off as, as heavily as it, as it is, uh, we can actually have, you know, um, conversational test tools where you can tell it, hey, I want to measure the impedance response of the output. I want to measure, you know, the gain response of the plant versus the output or the input impedance versus the output impedance to get the gain structure of the plant and see where the instability area is. But all those things require um, a lot of time and a lot of expensive instrumentation. So that that's an area where like AI, if you can simulate that, then you can get it to a point where you can actually build something and, and then take the simulated res results, layer it on top of the actual measure results, and then you can see, oh yeah, well this layering doesn't work. Maybe I need to go to a different gap. Maybe I need to go to a different, maybe I need to gap the center leg and not the outer leg. There's a lot, that's where all the secret sauce is, is the magnetics. So this is what LT Spice and Q Spice looks like. Um, like I said, you could download these two pieces of software. Uh, if you're just getting started in electronics, it's it's a wonderful software. Uh, think of these softwares as as a uh, a calculator for circuits. That's really what it is. And uh, they're state equations for every device. So it operates on writing state equations for the dynamic response of current and voltage for a capacitor, inductor, resistor, or a transistor. And then once you have the IV curves or the equations on how those uh, devices function. Then you can generate uh, symbolic libraries, which is what it is. So at first it might be intimidating, uh, the components, but it's nothing more than a symbolic mathematical engine where we can take the characteristic responses of capacitors and ductors and resistors and transistors and what have you and be able to connect them with uh, with nodal wires and then run the simulation and then hit hit the, the probe to see uh, you know what, what's going on in the circuit while it's running in either steady state DC or steady state AC. And then over here is the Ridley works, which takes it a little step further. It actually just concentrates on switch mode power supply designs. Um, you can create symbolic symbols based on the topology that you choose. And then you can actually export what you've created and run it in LT Spice and let LT Spice do the heavy mathematic, mathematical number crunching to get you to a convergent point on the power supply and make sure that the plan is not oscillating. So it's a, it's a really interesting tool. So, you know, now we're gonna dive into like the theory of switch mode power supplies. Um, you know, switch mode power supplies uh, basically focuses on two primary devices, actually three, inductors, capacitors, and transistors for switches, right? And the reason why we use inductors is because an inductor stores uh, energy in the uh, magnetic field, which is a function of the number of turns that you put on, on, the, uh, on the core and also the ferrite material. You take two inductors together, wind them on the same core, and you have yourself a transformer or a coupled inductor. Again, the capacitor stores energy, but it stores energy in the parallel plates, and that's a function of the separation of the plates and the electrolyte that's in between the plate, whether you use ceramics or some other saline material. But the fundamental takeaway from this is that it stores energy in the plates, 
Conversely, to an inductor, which stores it uh, in the magnetic field, this stores it in the electrostatic field between the two plate separations. Um, just to give you a big, uh, a little bit of a history of where power supplies were when they are, whenever power converting needed to be done, uh, and I'm talking about at the turn of the century, like in the 1860s, up until like uh, early 1900s, you had electrical rotating machines. That's all that we had. So if you wanted to convert DC to DC, you take two DC motors, couple one motor that runs at one speed, and then couple the other that runs at a different speed with a transmission in between, and you can convert like 100 volts DC to 50 volts DC. But that's all that we had at, at the moment. And this is, uh, you know, Michael Faraday days type of deal. Uh, much later, closer to the turn of the century in the, in the 1900s, we had gas discharge tubes. These were nothing more than, uh, these were predecessors to vacuum tubes. And these were usually mercury loaded. And how it worked is you had a switch closing when the mercury was cold and it hit and it, 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 um, it didn't expand, so it closed the switch and the magnetic field built up in the inductor as a process of the current flow, there would be power dissipated in the wire and, and mercury being a, a good conductor, it would separate and open the switch and it would just, it was like a brute force type of uh, mechanical switch using mercury and uh, couple that with a transformer and there, uh, you know, the mercury switch would arc, turn on and off and, and based on the turn ratios and power, uh, that you required based on the wire size and the opacity, uh, you're able to convert AC to another AC and then run an AC motor, couple it to a DC motor, and you could do your power inversion that way. So it was very tedious and time consuming, and these devices were very large. Uh, much later, around the 19, um, you know, 1900, a few years after this, the diode was invented by John Fleming in vacuum tube form, and Lee DeForest invented the, the triode and you know, there's discussions as to, uh, a lot of this was based on the Edison effect, which Edison didn't really recognize what it was. It wasn't until much later, but he documented it. Uh, Thomas Edison was very good at documenting things. Everything that he did, he documented and he immediately patented it, even if he didn't understand the subtleties or the dynamics of what he did. Uh, but anyways, these two folks were the ones that invented the dive and the triad. And then that much later led to the mid-1950s, um, you know, when the, transistor was first invented, and then much later on in the late 70s, integrated circuits came into play. Um, the first uh, commercialized type of switch mode power supply was the flyback uh, uh, converter, which basically was used on the, um, on the by General Motors, they're the ones that had the original patents on that. And the reason why this came about was because back then, uh, you know, if you needed to start your car, you needed to crank the, the, the crankshaft. It was a helical uh, spring. A lot of people lost limbs because sometimes the spring would snap. And as you were cranking this thing to build up inertia to turn the crankshaft, it would take your hand with you. So there was a safety issue, and Charles Kettering identified that. He was working at General Motors. He came up with a, a starter motor to do that. But then after the engine was started, they needed a way to synchronize uh, the mechanical motion of the crankshaft to the top dead center uh, point of the piston and then create an explosion inside the chamber to capitalize on the power stroke to be able to couple that into the transmission and then your, your uh, differential to get the car moving. But most of these systems were very brute force. They were based on points. There was no transistors back then. We're talking 1905, 1915 type of technology. But it worked. Uh, you know, the much later improvements were made with magneto systems. But it was just a, a mechanical flyback. And matter, as a matter of fact, a lot of car systems now use this, and they've gotten rid of having a distributor by having a Hall effect detectors, and they can actually detect where the crankshaft is in the position of the top dead center for the um, for the explosion. That's why you they were able to eliminate distributors and stuff. But those systems uh, have not changed fundamentally since like 1905 up until like the 1990s. Then like electronic systems came about and they did away with distributor system, uh, distributed point systems. And uh, just to get a feel as where 
now this, we're talking about an area now where like the maturity of switch mode power supply started ingressing into physical consumable products. The first uh, calculator that had a built-in switch mode power supply was the HP 35. Uh, that's a schematic of it there. And the first personal computer that had a switch mode power supply was the Apple IIc. Can anybody name the converter that was used on that? It was the Chu converter. That was a converter that was invented at, at uh, Caltech in the late 70s. Yes. So power supplies have like that little factor. Sure. The fact that some of them are using uh, you know, sunlight. So, what, what, I mean, when I think of power supply, I think of one of the AC. Yeah. But what is it in the, in the calculator? In the, from a battery to in the calculator, the power supply was used to charge the battery to run the calculator when it was oh. at night time. So it, back then, the, the, the calculators had a, a solar array that trickled enough voltage. In, and I think the PN junction can only develop 0.6 volts. So they would have a little tiny solar array that had several um, what's on? several uh, arrays of uh, that were added because we can only get about 0.65 uh, volts off of a PN junction. So they would have an array of them in series or in pair or a combination to get the voltage up and the, and the current also elevated. But a clever way of doing it is to do it through switching techniques by storing energy in the inductor or the capacitor. That way you can buck boost or buck boost what you have and then run the calculator uh, when there's no uh, solar light or even incandescent light. Um, but anyways, this, this brings us up to about the 1980s, so to speak. So, you know, like I mentioned, power conversion is kind of a very exciting field. I enjoy it because it makes you or forces you to be an expert almost in all these fields. It borrows from systems and controls because you have to design the feedback control system to make sure that the plant is, is not oscillating. You have definitely have to design switches. It borrows a lot from communication systems in terms of understanding the dynamics of the signals that are being synthesized both for switching on the semiconductor and also to see what the ripple currents and voltages are of the, and the losses on the electronic devices. So it borrows a lot from the semiconductor industry because you have to understand the magnetics, how the switches are formed, and you also have to keep the close attention to the thermodynamics because uh, you know if you design a power supply that gets you the voltage and current that you want, but it, it, it's running at 100 degrees C, it's not exactly very efficient. So the life cycle of the components are going to die out on you. And it heavily focuses on power and energy because we're always processing some power or energy from one form or, or the other. A uh, classic example of this is, um, you know, this is a classic power conversion. We take solar arrays, we charge, uh, you know, a, a battery bank in the house, then we stick an inverter, and then uh, we put a bidirectional converter to sell some of that energy back to the grid. Then if we need to charge our cell phones, we'll use a wall board connected to our iPhone. And then if we're mobile, we'll use one of those little uh, cigarette goggles to charge our phones. So here in this entire process, we've covered all the classifications of the types of converters that are out there. You can have direct uh, DC to AC converter, which we call an inversion of power, alternate current to alternate, uh, some other alternate current or voltage in the cycle converter. These are used for speed controls mostly in like industrial motor systems where you need to control both the voltage and frequency of a motor. And then you have alternating current to direct current. We call this rectification and then DC to DC. Uh, we just classify that as a converter, but there's a whole classification of, of converters based on what you're doing, whether you're elevating the voltage and lowering the current or vice versa, increasing the current and lowering the voltage. Um, Here's uh, basically the components that we just went over, uh, you know, inductors, transformers, capacitors, switches, and diodes. Those are uh, our uh, design components that we need, and we need to orient these in a certain fashion to be able to store and release the energy either from the inductor or the capacitor or both. Resistors are not really used as a processing component. In fact, we try to avoid those, but you need the resistors in there to be able to sense the readback voltage and also create the, the proper feedback servo. So the reason why we use inductors and capacitors is basically the power product, right? Current times voltage equals power. Interesting thing about inductors is they store energy, 
but their um, their bolt seconds when they're switched equates to zero because the area that, that you're using in terms of when you're turning the inductor on and off is equal. So you have bolt second balance. So if in this case, the voltage across the inductor is zero when it's turned on, but it can consume a ton of current. So when you multiply voltage time current, zero uh, voltage across the inductor when it's turned on with infinite current equals zero power. So in theory, it dissipates zero power. Conversely, on the capacitor, when you turn the capacitor on it, it holds a certain voltage level when you apply to it, but the current, uh, the average current over the period is zero. So again, the product, the power product is zero. And then if you have an ideal switch, uh, you know, when the switch is open, it has a voltage across it, but it has no current. So the power product is zero. And again, when it closes, the voltage uh, goes to zero, but the current can go to infinity, essentially. The reason why, uh, you know, they don't consume any power ideally, but there are intricacies in the design of an inductor and a capacitor like ESR and DSR in an inductor, for example, or a capacitor, where these, these non-idealities become very serious when you're processing large amount of power. So we're talking impedances of like, you know, 100 milliohms times 100 watts or something like that, or 100 amps, then it becomes quite significant. So, you know, the process of... Uh, of converting, uh, this is a not exactly a switch mode power supply, but it gives you an idea on how switches are used passively in a 60 hertz lamination transformer where we're using the, the orientation of those diodes, which we call a bridge, to turn on and off based on the cyclic chain of the AC input, charging the capacitor to get a DC output that's normalized. The problem with these systems is you're limited on the amount of current that you can get. And uh, there's automatic both both second reset on the inductor, so you're not you're using an inductor as a true transformer, but you're not storing any energy in the inductor. That's why it, it kind of limits the operation from a switch mode perspective. Okay, so here this brings us to the switch mode converter topologies. Um, as I mentioned, if you want to decrement the input voltage to the if you have an input of 12 volts like your car battery and you want to charge your iPhone which works on five, you would use something like a buck topology. Uh, and in fact, most of those little cigarette lighter USB dongles uh, are buck converters. Uh, if you want to elevate the input voltage much higher, you would use a boost topology. This is what was used for the flyback. In fact, if you take uh, a buck boost that can also invert and reduce the voltage and you cut this trace here, put a couple of the duct here, you end up with a flyback converter, which is what we showed before. These are non-isolated topologies, but we also have, uh, let's see, we also have uh, non-isolated uh, topologies, which use transformers for higher power densities. So this gives you an appreciation for all the things that are involved in the magnetics. This is the BH loop characterization for a piece of ferrite. And a lot of this stuff, what we're trying to accomplish as power engineers is trying to make the girth of this BH loop to be very fine and thin because there's a lot of coercive losses inside of the area of this BH loop. Also, if you notice, some of the earlier converters use one transistor only. So that means that we're, we're, we're not fully utilizing the, the complete excursion of the magnetic flux inside of the BH loop. We're only cutting half of it off. So where that plays a big role is on how much power you want to get out of the magnetics. You know what I mean? Um, and a lot of this stuff has to do with, uh, you know, Ampere's law. We have the coercive lo losses uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis and the, and the saturation density. In fact, some of these things come into play um, when you're actually designing the transformer. And this is what I was referring to about different winding styles. The, the, Straight winding one layer on top of the other. Progressive makes a triangular shape. Here you have a section bobbin where you physically set all these little tiny intricacies along with the layering of the tape and isolation play a lot into how, how the BH curve behaves. Sometimes if you build the transformer, you'd be like, well, I was, I, the transformer wasn't getting so hot, you know, or I'm not getting the right output or something like that, or it's going into some cyclic uh, misbehavior. So these are the isolated uh, topologies. If you notice some of the higher power ones, 
like the push pull, the half bridge, and the full bridge. Uh, you know, but so you know, you as a designer have to decide well, which topology do I use. A lot of this stuff is basically predicated. Well, how much power do I need? Uh, you know, and a lot of it has to do with how much voltage can you get out of out of the ferrite. So the only the only options that you have when it comes to selecting a ferrite based on this magnetic equation there uh, on the flux density. Uh, you know, the flux density is kind of set fixed. There's no Moore's law for magnetics at this point. We're talking high frequency magnetics, so it's like 0.5 uh, teslas or 500 millitesla. But you don't want to operate at the saturation point because then the inductor acts like an open air inductor and you lose all the storage elements that go in there and your current goes really high. So like for aerospace applications, sometimes they'll, they'll design 2.3. They'll, they'll operate at the pH loop over here before way before it goes to the knee for commercial products. And then for military products, they'll do 0.2, you know? But you never want to design close to this knee because this is a nonlinearity in the magnetics. So you have to keep in mind the type of ferrite that you use, the core area that you're going to use, the voltage that you're going to be using, the ampere seconds that you're going to be using, how the transformer is wound in terms of the geometry, the layering, and the tape, and the isolation and where on the BH loop you operate. Oh, and then you also have to select the topology. So there's, there's at least a dozen or more layers of complexity. It's not just pick any old ferrite and just start winding away. And then if you're designing commercial products, the other thing you got to keep in mind of is, you know, where is this power supply going to be used? There's regular, is there regulatory demands based on where the product is being used? Where does it, where is it going to be sold? United States, Europe, what classification does the product fall into? Uh, you know, where it'll be used, home, commercial, industrial, all these things. And, and to put a money factor on that, if, if you're designing a simple flyback converter that's going into a hazardous location, uh, not only is it time consuming to send it to the compliance agencies, but it could be quite costly, $10,000, $20,000 to get a product approved. And, uh, you know, it requires a lot of time and tuning. Sometimes you have to go, even though you have the power supply functioning as it would, Sometimes you have to go back and say, well, it's not doing what it needs to do because it's failing some compliance regulatory demand. So you have to go back and redesign filters and add more layers of components, making the power supply a little bit more expensive. Are we almost on time? Oh, I'm here, good, okay. So a lot of this stuff was really expedited in the late 70s by Robert Mamano. He worked at, at Unitrode. And one of the things that, that he was designed to do back then, uh, you know, when the transistors uh, came on board in the 1950s, we had to, as, as power supply engineers, we had to design not only just the magnetics, but also the switching semiconductor stuff. So if we needed a comparator, a fast switcher, a level shifter, a gate driver, all this stuff was all discrete components, and it wasn't until the late 70s that Unitro jumped on board and said, wait a minute, we can make a PWMIC that has a clock, a built-in clock, built-in error amplifier, uh, zero voltage crossing comparators, and we can articulate all this in one chip. You know, where, where the field has not progressed is including the magnetics in the chip. You know, that that's the area where we need to go into, and hopefully with this whole AI stuff is, but that was a pivotal moment because, um, you know, that was the first chip that was designed, the SG1524. But the greater majority of its predecessors, like the TL494, that's like the de facto chip that's used on all the um, switchable power supplies in the computers that you use. In fact, your cell phone might have a version of this, but it has all the, all the classical recipes of the instruments that you would need to design a switch mode power supply. You have two error amplifiers. You can use one for voltage uh, mode control, one for current mode control. You have, you can set those on a feedback pattern, which I'll show you for a Xerox machine that uses this exact uh, converter chip. You have under voltage lockout to shut off the, the switch mode power supply to make sure that it's not switching prematurely. You have dead time control in the case of push pull because you don't want to create uh, a punch through current component where both switches are on at the same time and there's a dead short. So you can actually set the dead time between the switching components if you're using a push pull uh, topology. And you have an internal oscillator and then you have a gate driver on the side. So these are 
the basic fundamental blocks for building any switch mode power supply. And that hasn't really changed in over, geez, over 50 years. You know, they're still using that. And this is a classical example of a switch mode power supply that uses that very same chip, TL494. And I've outlined the areas, the functional block areas. Um, this is a physical power supply that came out of a Xerox machine, believe it or not, that uses electrostatics to take a picture. You know, when you put a piece of paper on there, it electrostatically scans it, and, it, and then it electrostatically uh, hits the ink. And it adheres the ink to the paper based on the electrostatic picture that it does, but it needs a high voltage power supply. So we have one transistor there, one uh, transformer that's driving a voltage multiplier. And then we have a feedback servo that goes here. This is the voltage feedback that, that's being fed into one of these comparators. And then the other comparator, see it says C limit here. It's used to limit the current, which is being measured in this mode right here. And this is the reference voltage coming back. You may say, well, why do we need a reference voltage? Well, you need a reference voltage so that you know that the pulse width modulation of the switching uh, pulse and mark time of the converter is, is, is properly tuned because you can run out of PWM, uh, how you say, uh, on period and not have enough storage energy. So then you have to go back and redesign the inductor so you have enough latitude in the inductive storage and the capacitive storage so that you don't run out of headroom in the PWM converter and still converge to the voltage that you want to operate in. All right, so does anyone have any questions on anything? I Sorry, I kind of went a little fast. I just, there's a lot of material to cover and I really wanted uh, to get through it to give you guys a good feel as to you know what's involved in the field. Uh, do we have a few more minutes? Uh, yes. Well, that goes to this picture here. Okay, so this square wave is the PWM signal that, that you hit the switch in. And the reason why we use the square wave is because we can control the duty cycle. Uh, for example, if, if over here we're showing 50% duty cycle. So that means like if the conversion ratio on a on a buck converter, which I show here, it goes into measuring measuring the plant. Let's see. Okay. This K factor is the gain. Okay, so V out over V in is equal to D, the duty cycle. So that square wave that hits that switch is on for the same amount of time that it is off. The definition of, of, the, of the duty cycle is the on time divided by the on time plus the off time. So if the on time is one and the on and off time are equal, it's one divided by one plus one, which is two, which equals 0.5. So if you have 12 volts coming in and you set the duty cycle of that switch to 50%, your output is gonna be 50% of the input voltage. The reason why we use a square wave is because you can't switch a transistor with a sinusoidal wave. And the beauty about switching it progressively at different duty cycles is you open up the dwell time that you're charging that inductor or capacitor and usually you, you choose those values based on the amount of energy density that you need. Because if you choose them wrongly, then you might have too much charging on one inductor and not enough on the capacitor. And what happens is your efficiency goes down. So you, you have to play this like bi trilateral game of what duty cycle do I select? And then what magnetic components do I select? And also the frequency in which this duty cycle operates also is a big, big uh, contributor to the value of the inductor and capacitor because it forms a, a low pass filter. So for example, if that duty cycle square wave is running at hundred kilohertz. When you look at the, uh, when you, we're gonna focus on just the, to, this topology, the value of that inductor and that capacitor combined forms a low pass filter. So you will select those values such that you attenuate 
all the high frequency components and you're only left with the average DC value. And that's sort of, you know, there's a lot of mathematics involved, particularly when you break down the switching cycles to its Fourier components, which I kind of show down here. When you take the average of the switching cycle over one complete period, you'll, you'll be able to eliminate the high frequency components of this and you'll only get a DC average which lands in the middle of this. And if you expand or compress the on time and off time, you'll you'll be able to hit the sweet spot. Let's say you don't want five volts. Well, choose it a longer on time and your voltage will be much smaller. So I think that's my time. Thank you everyone for showing up. Hopefully you had a good time. And... So you look, do you look close by? I do.